Hello and welcome to December's Crime Watch. And there's a good deal of progress to report since last month's programme. Tonight's reconstructions include the bizarre case of a lollipop man who robbed a bank, lollipop in hand. And maybe in time for Christmas you can help police to catch the wicked witches. Two women swindling people out of their pension books. The detectives behind me right now are waiting for your call. It's live, remember. These are the officers investigating the cases tonight. All you need do is to watch the reconstructions we've made and see if there's anything or anyone you recognise. And if there is, here's the number, 01811 We'll repeat that number and give you local ones as the programme goes on. On average, about one Crime Watch case in every six results in an arrest because of information from Crime Watch viewers. And a similar number end up being solved by ordinary detective work. Paradoxically, though, the more progress in a case, the less we're allowed to report. That is, until there's been a conviction or an acquittal. At the moment, in Surrey, a man is detained awaiting trial, charged with the murders of Alison Day, Anne Locke and Marty Tamboza. We've shown reconstructions of all three crimes, and the inquiries were linked together with the help of a pathologist, who spotted similarities and phoned in. The man in custody was arrested during a painstaking process of elimination. When he comes to trial, one of the key witnesses may be a Crime Watch viewer who, until she saw the programme, had no idea that she might have been able to help. In Brighton, a man is in custody charged with the murders of the schoolgirls Karen Hadaway and Nicola Fellows. His arrest did not result from our Crime Watch reconstruction. But in Peterborough, a man was arrested the day after last month's programme after three viewers called in and named him. They rang from an area of the city where police believe an eight-year-old boy was taken and kept overnight. The man has been charged with the abduction of the boy, who comes from Lincoln, and he'll be committed for trial on the 5th of January. The boy, incidentally, was unharmed. Last month, we reconstructed a series of hold-ups around Darlington and Stockton by a lone man armed with a shotgun. You might remember he was a dab hand at mechanics and he tuned up stolen cars to perfection to make his getaway. 260 viewers rang in with so much important information that detectives have had to put it all on computer. Several people have been questioned and eliminated, but the police now say that as a result of Crime Watch, they have a new and very active line of inquiry. Last week, there was an arrest in South London over the murder of Lorna Hales. Again, Crime Watch did not produce the breakthrough. Police appealed for anyone who'd ever known Lorna to call in, and 72 people have already done so. Please do if you knew her. Eventually, though, detectives charged a man who was already known to them. He appeared in court this morning and has been remanded in custody. And a man has been convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment for a crime we covered back in January. The murder of Bronwyn Nixon, a hotel owner in the Lake District. This man, David Wynne Roberts, was wanted for questioning right from the start because he lived with one of Mrs Nixon's staff, but he disappeared just before the killing. David Roberts saw his picture on Crime Watch, and that same evening he walked into Chiswick Police Station in West London, accompanied by a solicitor, and claimed he was innocent. But meanwhile, five other viewers had called in to say they'd recognised Mr Roberts travelling between Blackpool and the hotel in Ambleside in the Lake District at about the time of the killing. What's more, because of the speed of the arrest, police were able to recover crucial evidence which would otherwise have disappeared. It was a red cashmere scarf, and at the trial, forensic scientists argued that the fibres were identical to fibres found on Mrs Nixon's body. The first of this month's reconstructions is of a crime that you may have read about. Indeed, you may have thought that it was solved. It's been in the news quite a bit. It's about two girls from the same school in Leicestershire who were both 15, both sexually assaulted and both murdered. But there were three years between the killings. The first was a notorious unsolved crime called the Black Pad murder after Black Pad Lane where the body was found. The victim was Linda Mann and her mother made a prophetic appeal for public help. If anybody knows anything or saw anything, they must come forward and help because it can only happen again. On Thursday the 31st of July this year, it seemed as though it had. Not far from where Linda had been strangled, Dawn Ashworth died in broadly similar circumstances. Suspicion fell upon a 17-year-old youth who lived locally. He was arrested and in a tape-recorded interview, he made a statement and was charged with Dawn's murder. But with nothing to link that suspect with the earlier crime, police used, for the first time in criminal history, a complex forensic test known as DNA, or genetic fingerprinting. The results were conclusive, but not what detectives had expected. And four weeks ago, they called a press conference. 
Those tests which were carried out did not implicate Mr. Buckland in the death of Linda Mann. The results of the tests indicate that a person as yet unknown was involved in the deaths of the two girls. In other words, whoever sexually assaulted Dawn Ashworth was involved in both murders. And unless he's caught quickly, he could endanger someone else. What follows is a reconstruction of Dawn's final afternoon in her home village, Enderby, near Leicester. It's summer holidays, and Dawn is helping out at the village newsagents. You got my wages? Yes, there you are. Thanks for making with me. Have a nice holiday, and don't forget to send me a postcard. I won't. Bye. Okay, bye, love. Bye. Ta this week's wages were especially welcome. Dawn and her family were off to Norfolk for their holidays. Dawn was a cheerful, bubbly girl, about to start in fifth form at the local grammar school. At 15, she wasn't yet much involved with boyfriends, but had a school friend whom she planned to see that night. She had the opportunity, being in the newsagents, to buy every new magazine that was available. And um, this really was what her money went on, clothes and her look. And she was changing and blossoming, really, from day to day. That Thursday, Dawn was going to the next village to see her friend. But her parents were also going out, so Dawn agreed to stay behind and look after her younger brother. Since the friend, Sharon, wasn't on the phone, she set off to tell her she wouldn't be free that night. Bye, Mum. I'll be back by seven. Dawn was seen on her way at about 4.15. Tony and Leslie were friends from school. This is Ten Pound Lane, which goes to Narborough. It's paved and lit at this end. But where it meets the M1, it narrows and eventually peters out into a track. At this point, Dawn had to make a choice. She could go either left across the motorway on the footbridge and go past the radiator works down to a dual carriageway or straight on and down the track. I always used to say to her, now, I would hate to think of you coming down here on your own in an evening. Um, and she, she I, I always used to impress on her, you should always use the footbridge, always go over the footbridge that way. But um, as I say, it is a shortcut and it was a nice day. And um, it is a well-used route, there's no doubt about it. In late July, the lane would have been heavily overgrown with shoulder-high summer foliage. At the end of Ten Pound Lane is King Edward Avenue and Leicester Road, a busy dual carriageway. It's now about 4.25 p.m. through the hedge, and Dawn would have been straight into Carlton Avenue, where Sharon lived. Hi, Sharon there. Oh, hi, no, she's just gone down to the phone box with Sue. Oh. Um, perhaps she'd like to try Sue's house. All right, thanks, bye. Bye. Hi, is Sue and Sharon there? I'm sorry, love, they're not here. They've oh. probably gone for a walk to the village. Why don't you go and look for them? All right, then. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Mrs Allsop is the last person we know who spoke to Dawn. Though from the kitchen in number eight, Mrs Walker saw her pass by. It seems Dawn decided not to go searching in the village, but to head straight home. A motorist saw someone who looked like Dawn going back across the dual carriageway towards Ten Pound Lane. The time was now 4.40. From here, it's 15 minutes walk to home. It was a lovely July late afternoon, though there was a shower at about this time. Dawn got within 100 yards of where the track becomes an open pathway. Somehow, she was taken off the track, was raped, 
and strangled. Two separate events suggest Dawn died between 5 and 5.30, the time she should have reached her home. Just the far side of the footbridge, across the motorway, two men were out in the yard of the radiator works. The sound seemed to come from the direction of Ten Pound Lane. At 5.30, two motorists saw a man run across the road from Ten Pound Lane. They had good reason to remember him. At the top of that embankment is the M1. Tony Painter, it's not often you see someone racing across six lanes of a dual of a motorway, let alone a dual carriageway. Certainly not. That youth's actions were strange to say the least. Uh, six lanes, just short of junction 21 on the M1, uh, which is the turn for Leicester. A pretty distinctive youth, about 20 years of age, late teens at least. He was five foot ten, quite athletic to get up that embankment as he did. Uh, and has, has been described by the witnesses. If anybody saw him at all running across the M1, Junction 21, you want them to call you? Certainly. Now, there was another guy apparently seen pushing a motorbike on the, on the dual carriageway, not on the B4114. Yes, this is the dual carriageway that the youth had run across to get to the bridge, and he uh, must have come down the other side of the M1, and we believe that the motorcyclist who was pushing his cycle along the pathway prior to that bridge could possibly have seen the youth uh, when he came off the M1. Now, as the name implies, Crown Much UK is a national programme, but to be blunt about it, it does seem quite likely, doesn't it, if not almost certain, that this killer is a local man. There are certain aspects of both the incidents that would tend to lead to that supposition, yes. That being the case, there must be husbands who are suspected by their wives. There must, I mean, it's a, it's a tragic circumstance, but there must be people who have suspicions about sons, uh, about husbands, about cousins. Yes, I, we understand that. Uh, and my appeal tonight is that the decision to uh, it, let me know that uh, they suspect a relative is an extremely hard one to make. But we've now had two murders in three years, and there's a distinct possibility that this man may strike again. And I ask uh, any person who is shielding or suspects that a relative is involved to take that into account and to let me know. I'm sure that probably someone will have suspicions and they be, may be unfounded, but I wish to assure them that the information they give us will be in the strictest confidence. Superintendent Painter, thank you very much indeed. If there is anything you can do to help, please ring us right now. The number in London is 01811 8055. That's 01811 8055. Or you can ring the incident room at Enderby. That's on 0533 482 400. That's 0533, the code for Leicester, 482 400. It leaves a, a tremendous gap. Um, it's not only a daughter that we've lost, but personally I've lost a very good friend and uh, that's what I'd brought her up to be, uh, so that she could come to me with anything at all. And it's that friendship, really, that I miss more than anything. Dawn Ashworth's mother, please do help if you can. Well, now for Incident Desk, where we invite police officers to appeal to you directly. Tonight, news of arrests in Liverpool in a fraud case, how a stolen speedboat made its way home to Aberdeen, and in Hampshire, the show dogs who've been kidnapped from their kennels. Here are Constable Helen Phelps and Superintendent David Hatcher. First news from last month. £36,000 worth of travellers' cheques were stolen in Hartlepool and cashed at banks from London to Glasgow. Following calls to the programme, a man has been arrested in Liverpool. We're still anxious to identify this man, though, we think he comes from Merseyside, but he might be anywhere in Britain now. And you may remember that last month they had me outside Television Centre in the pouring rain with a speedboat similar to one stolen from near Aberdeen. 
Well, it was worth it. Six days after the programme, a viewer found the boat in woods near Bladen, as in the races. It's now back with its owner in Scotland, who's delighted. He's just hoping the trailer and engine turn up soon so that he can actually use the boat again. Our first case this month is a murder in North London. Thomas Walker, who's 61, lived alone in Holloway. On Tuesday, September the 9th, someone got into his home, beat him up and tied him to a chair with lamp flex. As a result, Mr Walker died of a heart attack. That afternoon, a neighbour saw a man talking to Mr Walker on his doorstep. He was in his early 20s, stocky and with brown hair, and he's never been traced. The other clue comes from this lamp. Forensic experts took a photograph of a shoe print from the base of it. We now know that that print is from a size six and a half high-tech gold league squash shoe, and it was a fairly new one. Now, high-tech sell thousands of these a year, but one of their wholesale outlets, South Sun and Whitcomb in North Down Street, is just at the bottom of Caledonian Road, where Mr Walker lived. Detectives believe that there's just a chance that the killer may have bought his shoes direct from that warehouse. Because since August, they have sold just 10 pairs direct to the public, and three of them were size six and a half. It's a long shot, but if we could trace the 10 people who bought Gold League squash shoes from South Sun and Whitcomb, it could be crucial. Next, a massive series of cheque frauds which have lasted five years, covered seven counties and cost the banks and indirectly their customers one and a half million pounds. Already 33 people have been charged in connection with some of these offences. Since 1981, more than 800 cheque cards have been stolen, mainly in the southern counties and often at popular beauty spots such as Beachy Head, the South Downs and Windsor Great Park. The thefts have often been in car parks and from cars where there's a handbag or case visible. The cheques were generally cashed in small shops in London. As part of this operation, and the inquiry into a number of other serious offences, we'd like to speak to this man. He's Paul Cassidy. This was taken on a recent holiday on the Costa del Sol. He uses a variety of surnames, including Wilson, Wigley, Goddard, Lowe and Edwards. And this is him in a London hotel. Paul Cassidy is dangerous. If you see him, don't approach him. And if you know where he is, Ring us now. And a miserable crime next. Two weeks ago, a caravan was stolen from outside this house in Aylesbury. The caravan belonged to Barry and Adele Crane, who are both permanently confined to wheelchairs. Caravanning was the only way they could take a holiday alone. Over the last 10 years, they've been all over the country and abroad to France and Belgium. The caravan that's been stolen was a new one, an award TriStar. It's cream with blue coach lines and bubble windows. There's a chasse number. And it had a couple of unusual features since the cranes made special alterations. The door had been made wider and they'd converted the inside to take a wheelchair. The cranes told us that with two years of repayments still to go, they now won't be able to get away in 1987 or 1988. We found that speedboat last month. So give us a call if you have any ideas about the caravan. Finally, an unusual but growing crime. For some years now, there's been evidence that top show dogs are being stolen and shipped abroad. The specialist press has had some reports of a trade in show dogs to countries as far as Singapore and West Africa, and it seems some of them may well have been stolen. The thefts seem to fall into two categories. Guard dogs have been a particular target. This top-bred Rottweiler, K. Sarah Dark Harry, was stolen from Hertfordshire, but he was taken two months ago now, and the chances of finding him must be slim but there was a theft of some show dogs, the other main victims, just two days ago. These gorgeous Saluki puppies are just six weeks old and on Tuesday, five out of a litter of seven were taken from their kennel. The owners, Mr and Mrs Copperthwaite from Hampshire, this is them with the puppy's grandfather, had fed them at 8 p.m. and by nine, they'd been removed. This sweater was dropped outside their house. It has scorch marks on it and we're sure it was dropped by the thieves. And a final point of appeal. These two were left behind. Cheeky little things, aren't they? If you've seen their brothers and sisters, do give us a ring. The number to call if you can help is 01811 That's 01811 Our next reconstruction is not the sort of crime that makes front page news, but it's greatly distressed and upset a lot of elderly people across the home counties and in the Midlands and in the West Country. 
Over the past three years now, more than 120 people have been persuaded to part with their pension books on their doorsteps by two very plausible bogus social security officials. The pair arrived in Bristol towards the end of last summer. Saturday the 30th of August, the public library in the St George area of Bristol. Hello. I wonder if you can help me. Yes, I'd like to look at your voting lists, please. Yes. Which one do you want? I was thinking of the area down towards this way. To the librarian, there was nothing suspicious about the young woman. Voting lists are often asked for by market researchers and mail order companies. They show the names of householders street by street. Goes straight from that. Yeah. But after she left, librarians found several pages had been torn out. Is it just one page? Sure. No. No, it's more than two. The next Monday, September the 1st, less than a mile from the library is Bruce Road. At nine o'clock, a middle-aged woman called at a house there. Good morning, Mrs. Green. I'm from your social service office. Uh, it's about your pension. Uh -huh. It appears you're going to get a little bit extra. Oh, that's really nice. Yes, it's on the heating allowance. But I'll yeah. need your book. Oh, would you like to come in? Uh, no, I, w I won't come in. As a matter of fact, my children have got the flu and I wouldn't like to pass any germs oh. on to you. Thanks very much. I'll take this down to the office. You should get it back tomorrow, but anyhow, Wednesday at the latest. All right. Yes. Goodbye. Mm -hmm. 20 minutes later, a few streets away. Good morning, Mrs. Wilson. I'm from the Social Security. It's about your pension. You're going to get a bit extra. Uh, it's on the heating allowance, one pound 11. Oh, that's good. Mm -hmm. But I'll need your book. Must you? Oh, yes, I'm afraid so. I think you'd better come in, then. Uh, no, I won't come in, thank you very much. I'm just getting over a touch of bronchitis. I wouldn't want to give you a germ, would I? Vera Popel in Heath Street was another victim, and there were two more that morning. DHSS investigators now believe the Bristol offences were by two women who'd been operating together for over two years. They started in London. In 1984, there were 48 identical incidents. Then, in 1985, they moved further afield, 26 more as far as Peterborough and Reading. And this year, another 46 cases from Coventry and the Midlands down to the south coast. And now it seems the same two women are trying another, more shocking method. This is Colchester General Hospital in Essex in August. Good morning, Mrs Adams. Good morning. I'm your social worker. Oh. Yeah. Now, Dr. Elliot asked me to call in and see you to see if there was anything you wanted. Well, um, I could do with a clean nighty and perhaps another vest, if you would. Yes. I shall need your keys. Oh. Would you mind passing my purse? OK. Thank you. Do you know where I live? Yes, I know your house. Thank you. Right. Well, I should be able to get these back to you within a day or two. Will that be all right? Oh, yes. Very well, then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, thank you. A few days later, Mrs Adams was too ill to remember exactly when, the woman was back. Mrs Adams? Good morning. Oh. Hello. How are you today? Oh. Not too good. <laughs> well, I bought your clothes for you. Oh, thank you. And a little bit of good news. You're going to get a little extra on your heating allowance. So your pension will go up. If you could let me have your pension book, I'll take it and get it adjusted. Thank you. Now, don't lose it. No, I won't. Uh, but you should get this back in about three days' time. Oh. Is that all right? Yes. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh, there is one other little thing. It's my daughter's birthday soon. Do you think you could post her birthday card in the box outside? Of course, dear. Oh, there we are. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. 
the card never arrived. There have been similar incidents in other hospitals in the south of England. And these are the places where the stolen pension books have been cashed, usually in sub-post offices well away from where they were taken and several weeks later. Generally, it's the younger woman who picks up the money. Hello. Hello. I've got my grandmother's pension book here. Yeah. She's come to stay with me and she hasn't been well, poor thing, so she's not been able to get out. Mm -hmm. um, I've signed the back of the pension book. Yes. So there's six weeks' money there. You have to fill up a form. Yeah, the change of address form, yes, yes, I've got that here. Right. That's 200. Right. Then 20, 40. 240. Thank you very Thank much. You. To date, the women have walked away with over £20,000. Well, Detective Sergeant Don Bond, all the pensioners have eventually got their money back from the DHSS, haven't they? Yes, no one's actually lost any money. But, of course, they've all been through quite a, a traumatic um, experience. They've grown up in an age when they trust people and they now find that um, people aren't that tr trustworthy. Um, they've been quite shocked by it all. Yes. When the keys to Mrs Adams' house were taken when she was in hospital, nothing was taken, I gather, from her house? No, oh, it's rather strange that. They seem to have concentrated just on the pension book aspect. They took nothing at all from the house when they had opportunity to. Right, so all they're interested in is the pension books. Mm -hmm. Could we have their descriptions, the older woman, first of all? Yes, she's um, 40 to 55 years of age. She's described by a couple of the old ladies as having um, rather prominent teeth, um, often described as having a pale complexion, and on occasion has been described as a Marjorie Proops look-alike. We have to bear in mind that they wear a number of different disguises and wigs, so it's slightly confusing. Yes. What about the younger woman? Yes, now she's um, generally described as mid-twenties, 22 to 28 years of age. She's uh, 5 foot 3 to 5 foot 5 inches tall, uh, fair hair and slim build. Now, I gather you've just heard that an electoral roll has been stolen from a library somewhere in the Bradford-on-Avon area. Yes, that's right, in Wiltshire. In the last day or two, they've found that their electoral roll has disappeared completely from the library. It may be connected, it may be not, but it would certainly be worth people in Wiltshire being just a little bit more cautious. What are your main points of appeal to viewers? I think threefold. Uh, firstly, to um, librarians, to pay particular attention to people asking to see the electoral roll then to the uh, post office staff to be again just a little bit more cautious with people who are saying that they've got elderly relatives staying with them temporarily and can they cash their pensions for five or six weeks and then thirdly to the um, elderly ladies themselves just uh, because someone knows your name it doesn't necessarily mean they're authentic they should always ask for an identification card and then all three of those categories uh, may well have seen a vehicle uh, it's important that um, we get whatever information we can on it, any vehicle. There's been no sightings as yet. A car number would be very useful, yes. right. And remember, just because somebody comes to your door and knows your name, it doesn't mean to say you can trust them. Do always ask for identity. If you recognise either of those two women, remember they have a number of different disguises, please ring police here in the studio on 01 811 8055, or you can ring the special number set up by the DHSS for this case, and that is 01 403 2880. 01403-2880. Incidentally, if you are worried about confidence tricksters or generally feel vulnerable about strangers at your door, there are some simple precautions you can take. David and Helen, now explain. The first and most obvious thing to say is do try and get to know your neighbours. Don't be too shy to ask them to keep an eye out for you. If they're unfriendly, then ask your local to police to look out for you. When a stranger comes to your door, always ask to see identification. And if they give you a card, really read it and examine it. In fact, if you've got a phone, don't be too embarrassed to leave your visitors on the doorstep with the door shut while you ring to check up on them. And as you've just seen, you need to check on women as well as men. If you're not on the phone, ask any unexpected visitor to come back when you can have someone with you. And if strangers come offering to do our jobs, my advice is thank them and send them away. Above all, if you have an elderly or vulnerable relative or neighbour, remember it's partly your responsibility if they become the victim of a crime. Make sure you see them or call them regularly. And if you see or hear anything suspicious, go and check. Call us. Don't ever feel you're wasting our time. There are, of course, lots of practical gadgets which can give you physical protection as well as a feeling of security. In terms of your front door, 
that means viewers and chains can put your caller on the defensive and make you feel much safer. It's always a good idea to be able to see your caller when the doorbell rings. This traditional spy hole viewer gives you a wide angle image outside the door. This cyclops viewer is more sophisticated. You don't have to peer through it to see your caller. Instead, an image appears on this small screen. And here's another type of viewer. It's actually a piece of one-way glass. But from outside, it looks like an ordinary door plate. However, for any of these viewers to be effective, you must have a light outside so that you can see visitors at night. And if you do decide to open the door, it's always a good idea to have a door chain or a door limiter fitted. They both perform the same task and prevent the door being opened more than a few inches. When the door's closed, the door limiter also doubles as a sturdy bolt. Finally, why not establish a special ring or knot that friends or neighbors can use? But always use your viewer, and remember, you don't have to let anyone in if you don't want to. Well, in most parts of the country now, there are schemes to help people who might not be able to afford any of the new locks or equipment they might need. Many of those schemes offer locks at cost price and free fitting. The crime prevention officer at your local police station will tell you everything you need to know absolutely free. Our final case tonight is a daylight robbery in which the bandits were armed with pistols, a shotgun and a lollipop. But it was no joke. A large gang was involved, perhaps half a dozen men, and the getaway through city streets was almost as violent as the robbery itself. Detectives on the case, some of whom are here tonight, hope that other villains will help identify the gang. The robbery was on a Tuesday, exactly one calendar month ago, Tuesday the 18th of November. But our reconstruction begins one month before that. It's in the Hyde area of Manchester. Tuesday, October the 21st, Hyde Town Hall. The public corridor there overlooks the Royal Bank of Scotland in Corporation Street. A witness vividly remembers two men loitering there. It's about 10.45 in the morning. Four weeks later, Tuesday the 18th of November. Detectives have pieced together three events that morning, each of which was very slightly unusual. This was 11.25 in Corporation Street, a couple of hundred yards down from the bank. This was a few minutes later in Water Street, where there's another entrance to the town hall. And finally, about a mile away, here in Raglan Street, between 10.40 and 11.40, at least five witnesses saw a motorcyclist. He seemed to be keeping an eye on two cars. It's 11.30. The total delivery was over £200,000. The coins went in first. The boxes of notes contain £25,000 each.
this man, Stephen Campbell, who's a builder, tried to keep up with the van to get the registration number. What seemed to be a gun brandished at him slowed Mr. Campbell down. And another lorry found itself unwittingly involved. But the gang was prepared to prevent anyone following them. Adamson's industrial estate. At the back of the yard, there's a bridge over the canal and a way out to Raglan Street, but it's only wide enough for one vehicle. Move it! Move your lorry! Move it! Come on, get out! Move it! Move your lorry! Back! Come on, move it! is Hyde in Manchester. Tuesday the 18th of November, 11.30 in the morning, the Royal Bank of Scotland is on the corner of Corporation Street and Market Street. The getaway was down Corporation Street towards Great Norbury Street, away from the town centre, left into Great Norbury Street, right into Croft Street, through Adamson's Yard, that's where they abandoned the van in the industrial estate, ran onto Ragnar Street, picked up the getaway cars and made off there. Now, John Richardson, they were a pretty ruthless bunch of people. I gather one of the guards, at least, was, was quite badly hurt. Yes, in fact, two guards were quite badly hurt. One of them had to receive hospital treatment and is uh, still not returned to work. Now, we've got some descriptions. We saw a fairly good close-up, in fact, of the reconstruction of one of them, which is a good indication you've got a good description. What was he like, the lollipop yes, man? Yes, the lollipop man. Well, he's described as between uh, 28 and 35 years of age. He's slim and he was of, uh, had a moustache. Now, he looked fairly similar to a guy seen a month earlier in the town hall, looking as though he was sussing out the bank. That's correct, yes. We feel that this particular man may, in fact, uh, be the man that took the part of the lollipop man on the raid. Now, here we see them side by side, and through the magic of video fits, we can uh, change them so that we can put the disguise on the uh, left onto the one on the right, and there are obvious similarities. Always dangerous to draw too many <coughs> conclusions from that, though. Here in front of us uh, is the... The lollipop, that uh, I'm sure lollipop people must hate these being called lollipops. Where did they get this from? Well, we don't know. We've not found the owner of it. Right. So if anybody knows where this comes from, I gather it's five years old or so, at least. That's correct. Well, it's said that... Uh, it's an old type. That's correct, because the modern ones have a plastic pole. Right. Now, all these are bits and pieces that, that were found. These yes. were the glasses he was wearing. Those were the glasses worn by the lollipop man and were subsequently found uh, in the getaway red transit van. Where were these found, the balaclavas and these, uh, these plastic gloves? These were found in Thrustlebank Street in Hyde, about half a mile away from where the robbery occurred. Right. Perhaps the most important clue, two of these were stolen. These are the Securical cash yes. boxes. £25,000 in each one, That's I correct, yes. That's a, a replica of the two that were actually stolen during the raid. Difficult to get rid of, these things. Yes, and I would appeal for anyone that may have found uh, one of these to come forward. Right. These are quite uh, reckless and dangerous people. There's been a, another robbery this week, in fact. Uh, somebody was hurt in that. Clearly somebody else is going to get hurt if they're not stopped. If you can help in any way, there is a substantial reward. There really is £10,000 if these people are caught. Here is the number, 01811 8055, or you can call the Manchester Police Direct on 061 330 8321. That's 061, the code for Manchester, 330 8321. Before we go, here's your last chance this year to see if you recognise someone you know on Crime Watch. We have some photos processed by the police from negatives they found in this Pentax camera here. The camera has almost certainly been stolen. Was it yours? Or is that yours? Or is that you on the right? 
Well, if you recognise the baby or the father, if that's who it is, give us a call and you can have your camera back. This is the number and the lines are open until midnight. 01 811 8055. And if you're one of those who say all babies look the same, OK, well, it's obviously not yours. But uh, if it is uh, your daughter or son, who knows, please give us a call. There's the number. And incidentally, would the man who rang on the Dawn Ashworth case and said that he was the one that ran across the M1 motorway, please call again, as you said you would. Ask to speak to Superintendent Painter. Superintendent Painter, you'll be put straight through. It will be, of course, in confidence. All the local numbers are on CFAX. They're on page 186 there. Our address is Crime Watch UK, BBC Television, London W12 8QT. There it is. We'll be back, as always, to tell you what calls we've had uh, in an hour and a half from now. That's Crime Watch Update at 11.30. If you can't stay up till then, we'll have a very, very happy Christmas. Uh, if you're a criminal or a driver, please don't spoil someone else's. Whatever happens, don't have nightmares. Do sleep well. Good night. Good night. Hello and welcome back. Detectives here have been taking some very valuable information on the phone since we came off the air. And it looks as though we have some particularly important calls on the Dawn Ashworth case. For that, Nick. Indeed, uh, that was our first reconstruction tonight. The final hours of a Leicestershire schoolgirl, Dawn Ashworth, on Tuesday, July the 31st. She was walking home just half a mile from where another girl had been murdered in 1983. Dawn was sexually assaulted and strangled. It was a quarter of a mile from her home. Now, soon after she was last seen alive, two motorists saw a blonde youth sprinting across Leicester Road. Now, Tony Painter, I gather someone who claims to have been that man has phoned. Yes, uh, one of many phone calls is from a youth who alleges that he was, in fact, the person that ran across the motorway. He has rang off. Uh, he said that he would ring back, and he hasn't done so. I would like to say to that youth that I'm investigating a double murder. I am not particularly interested in any motorway offences. If that youth has nothing to fear, then I would ask him to contact me as soon as possible. Right. And you also had people ringing in with their suspicions. One in particular, I gather, very distressed, suggesting it was someone they knew very, very well and they had good reason to believe so. Yes, uh, we mentioned earlier that, in fact, uh, someone may have suspicions over a relative. It would appear that the caller has these suspicions uh, and before he could uh, tell us all the story, he obviously became too distressed and rang off. I could only ask that person to consider what I said earlier and to ask him to contact me as soon as possible. He can call you here, of course, immediately, or he can call you at the incident room. Yes, the incident room number is 0533 482400. Right, Mr Painter, thanks very much indeed. So. Well, next the case of the two con women who have walked away with more than £20,000. They've been calling at pensioners' homes, posing as DHSS officials, and persuading them to hand over their pension books on the promise of an increase in heating allowance. Thanks very much. I'll take this down to the office. You should get it back tomorrow, but anyhow, Wednesday at the latest. 
Well, Detective Sergeant Don Bond, you've just told me you've had an overwhelming response and some particular news. Yes, we've had a fantastic number of um, replies, almost a hundred calls to this extension alone. Um, some very interesting uh, phone calls, three from different sources, all pointing us in the direction of one person and we should be looking uh, very closely at them. Um, also some interesting information from Stevenage where um, someone was um, in the area yesterday using this, um, this same sort of um, method and we'd be interested to hear from anyone else in the Stevenage area. Uh, we'd still be interested in a car number. We've had no real information yet on um, cars and I think a car number would be, would be crucial. And can I just make a general reminder that uh, genuine DHSS officials will always have an identification card and will always give an official receipt. So it looks anyway as so we might just be closer to finding those two women. Promising, yes, promising. Let's hope so. Don, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, we've had 100 calls to Manchester and many more here on the raid a month ago in Hyde in Manchester. A, a large gang set upon a Securicord delivery, brandishing everything from pistols to, believe it or not, a lollipop. One of those guards was uh, quite badly hurt. There's been another raid subsequently. You've had a large number of calls. How good is the evidence you've been getting? We're very pleased with the calls up to now. We've had well over 150 calls, actually. And we've got one particular line on the, one of the getaway vehicles, which is very interesting. Really? You're being very cagey. You're not going to tell me what it is? I'm certainly not at this stage, no. OK. We had a very, very good description of one of the criminals, the one that was brandishing that uh, lolly that we saw in the, in the reconstruction. Yes, yes. Here's the, the video fair. What, uh, what leads have we got on him? Well, he's the Harold Lloyd look-alike, and uh, we've had a lot of calls referring to him, and uh, in my opinion, someone out there must know who he is and the rest of the gang involved in the robbery. I saw that quite a lot of your leads were actually coming from members of the criminal fraternity, or former crooks. That's correct, yes, particularly in the Manchester area. Right, there is a big reward for this. There is, is indeed. It? There's a £10,000 reward, and uh, I would ask that... Uh, someone come forward if they know who has done this particular case. Right. Let me just say, incidentally, some people have rung up saying they found the Securicor canisters in which the money was, was stolen. At least they've seen people with them. It's illegal to hold those, isn't it? It is indeed, yes. So uh, if you know anybody who's got a Securicor canister, do give, us a, a, do, do give us a call. Mr Ritson, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, now to find out what information has been coming through on tonight's incident desk cases, here's first David Hatcher. David, we showed pictures earlier on of Paul Cassidy, who's been wanted in connection with a series of cheque frauds, and there's been a development, I gather. That's right, yes. We've had about 20 calls here at the studio, Sue. So, uh, he uses various names, Wilson, Wigley, Goddard, and so on, and three of those calls have given us some very useful information. One gives us a positive sighting of him in North London. Another one, a lady thinks she had a cup of coffee with him at an airport lounge, and one of the pictures we showed was of him taking one of his holidays on the Costa del Sol. Uh, and also there's a possibility of him being involved in a car sale. So we're optimistic there. So more news possibly coming. And we talked about the show dogs and the guard dogs who have been stolen and taken to other countries. Yes, everybody sat at home and went, ah, when they saw the pictures of the dogs. Um, we've got five of these little characters still outstanding. They're, two of them are black and fawn, in fact. They're not all the same colour as these two chaps. Two of them are pale cream, like the ones on the tape there. And there's a fawn one, also outstanding. These could be anywhere. Nobody's told us where they are. We've had a few people ring up saying that they've been offered such dogs. They're Salukis. They're very rare, only a few thousand of them probably in the country. We want to know where they are now. See if we can get them home to their mum for Christmas. Somebody must know. Right, see if we can find their brothers and sisters. David, thank you. One of the uh, saddest cases on Incident Desk was that of Thomas Walker, the man who died of a heart attack while he was being attacked in his own home in Holloway in North London. Helen, do we know anything more? A couple of clues. Firstly, a man was seen talking to Mr Walker outside his home in Caledonian Road in Holloway. He's described as stocky, early 20s, with brown hair. I know one woman in particular asked us to show this artist's impression again. She's got a thought of uh, who it is. Now, the shoes as well. Lots of people have been ringing up about these shoes. There was an imprint. That's our main point of concern. They're size six and a half. It's a high-tech gold league squash shoe. They could have been bought direct from a wholesaler of South Sun and Whitcomb, close to where Mr Walker lived. Now, size six and a half is very, very small. So that's either uh, a child or a very relatively small man. At any that's rate. right. The stolen caravan, very sad story, again because it was a caravan that a disabled couple used for their holidays. A lot of kind viewers have rung in offering the cranes other holidays. However, 
The key point is getting their caravan back to them. Now, one lady would like to see it again. She believes she knows where it is. It's an award tri-star caravan. It's got blue bubble windows and blue coach lines. It has been specially adapted. It's got a three foot wide door and inside it's been made for use of someone in a wheelchair. Let's see if we can find that one. Have we found the parents of the baby? Photographs that were developed by the police recovered from a camera that itself had been recovered. We have identified this person. His name is Benjamin. Ah. <laughs> and his grandfather took the snaps of Benjamin and his father um, some time ago with a Pentax camera. That camera was stolen in a burglary five or six weeks ago in Cheadle, Greater Manchester. Gosh, I bet Grandad must have been surprised when grandson comes up on the screen. That's all from uh, Crime Watch for this month and indeed for this year. Whoever you are, whatever you get up to, have a very happy and good neighbourly Christmas and whatever happens, don't eat too much, don't drink too much, don't have nightmares, do sleep well. Good night. Good night.